few lectures to look at the clinical aspects of what you've just given us anatomically and to see how that, par that plays into how to make some of these deformities not deformities anymore. So with that, uh, why don't we turn it over to David Redfern and David's gonna speak on the involvement of the lesser toes and how to try and correct some of those problems that are so confounding. Bill, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share the screen and hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, let's go to presentation. So good evening and thank you for asking me to give the talk. I work in London, I'm based in London, and I would say that probably the first ray steals the limelight most of the time, um, but I'd describe per percutaneous first ray surgery as an evolution, and the lesser toes, I think, is where the real revolution is. Don't get me wrong, I'm a great proponent of first ray percutaneous surgery too, but I think there's lots to learn in the lesser toes that can be really great for our practices. I think you end up with a much larger armamentarium of surgical procedures or surgical options with the percutaneous surgery. And in a nutshell, it allows correction in three planes, but it's not at the expense of our accumulated wisdom, but it does mean that we can perhaps deal with the uh, deformities more fully and with less risk to the soft tissues. Now, we can't possibly cover all of the lesser toes in the, this short talk. So I'm gonna concentrate on hammer toes, distal metatarsal metaphyseal osteotomies, and bunionettes, which is really an offshoot of that. Instead of presenting all the papers as we go along, I've given Elena Frey um, a, a Word document with all the references in, and she's going to distribute that. And I assure you, I will try not to make statements that aren't supported by evidence. And if I am, I will let you know that I'm doing so. Um, so moving on, hammer toes. Do we think about them any differently? I would argue strongly, no, we don't. But I look at my toes, lesser toes, probably much more carefully than I used to because I'm not afraid to see that little bit of varus or valgus malalignment that goes with the hammer toe because I know I've got a solution for it. So you can be much more discerning, uh, a bit more of an honest critic of, of what's there and what needs to be corrected. Um, and we of course want to correct the deformity that we see in front of us, but always one eye on why it occurred and address that etiology to try and prevent recurrence. Um, contraindications are really the same as open surgery and cautions also the same. Now, really, there are no uh, lesser toe deformities in principle that could not be corrected with percutaneous surgery. The question is really whether you as a surgeon feel confident to do so or decide in this particular case that that's what you want to do. There's certainly a percutaneous option for all of the open surgery that we're used to undertaking, fusions, etc. But there are additional options with percutaneous, as I said, as well. And if you're starting out, flexible deformities probably tend to be a little bit easier than the rigid ones. So we need to understand what's going on. Um, and the first comment I'd like to make is that the tendons are our friends. So the extensors, when the toe is straight, are very good at extending the interphalangeal joints. But when you end up with hammer toe deformity, so the plantar plates uh, ruptured and the toes deformed, then the extensors are not acting in a friendly manner and they are more powerful at extending the toe at the MTPJ level and much weaker at maintaining straight uh, interphalangeal joints. And the same goes for the flexors. They, became, they become much stronger flexors of the interphalangeal joints once the toe deformity has occurred. So tendons are our friends and we want to preserve them as possible. So we don't start with tendons in my book. We, we, we would rather start with the bones. It may be a little bit contentious. I'm quite happy to have that conversation. Um, this is a busy slide, but let's make it simple. You've got soft tissue and bony options. And what really is new with the percutaneous surgery is these uh, little phalangeal osteotomies. And yes, they have been described if you look carefully in the open literature some time ago, but never really took off, difficult to fix and difficult to perform. So these mini osteotomies can be broken down. Osteotomies of P1, the proximal phalanx, will be correcting deformity at the MTPJ level. Osteotomies of the middle phalanx, the P2, will correct deformity at the PIPJ level. And of course, P3 osteotomy is a little bit more delicate, not used so often, but they'd be correcting DIPJ deformity. We've heard that you can do selective tenotomies percutaneously. Indeed, you can, and they're very useful too. Um, but I think it's the, um, it's the osteotomies that are really the new thing. 
So set up, well, the nice thing with the lesser toe surgery, as opposed to the first ray surgery, is that you can be combining percutaneous lesser toe surgery with open uh, first ray surgery. So for open surgery, you really want the foot fixed on the table. Uh, for percutaneous surgery of the first ray, you want the foot off the end of the table. So if you're doing your first MTPJ fusion, you can do it in your usual manner and then decide you're going to add in this percutaneous lesser toe correction at the same time. And I like the setup to be pretty uh, similar each time. It keeps it all straightforward for the staff as well as myself. And the image intensifier, great bit of kit that we really need. The mini C arm is, by, by, is definitely the optimum. I keep that to the right and you can see I've got an arc of access to the foot uh, from the left hand side around to the end of the table. Okay, so let's deal with MTPJ deformity. I'm just breaking it down here. So of course we've got the selective uh, tenotomies, the extensive tenotomies, but we've got this P1 plantar closing wedge that you can see uh, I've drawn in here, and that's what we're going to take a little look at. Now these are done with small uh, burrs, eight millimeter in length, two millimeters in diameter. The diameter is pretty consistent throughout most of them, although there are lots of uh, varieties out there, different uh, companies, but I use a two millimeter diameter and an eight millimeter cutting length for a lesser toe because it's not too long. Uh, and it goes in from a planter approach through the flexor sheath and into the bone. And you can see there the flutes are buried in the bone. Once the flutes are in the bone, you're not going to damage the soft tissues. Um, and once it's inside the bone, you do a sweep from left to right. And this is not an in-depth discussion about the surgical technique, which needs to be undertaken in a lab in cadavers initially. But you can see when you've done that, you've made the sweep and you've left the dorsal cortex intact, you've created a hinge. And it really does click closed and you get your correction at the MTPJ level. If it's not enough, you can go back in, put the burr through the slot again, take a little bit more bone and do the same thing again. If it's not enough, you can complete the osteotomy and that gives you a bit more freedom. And with experience, you can even shorten a bit further. That's not often required. Now, I mentioned the tendons are our friends. This is where they come in. So in a flexible deformity, you've corrected the deformity at the MTPJ level by making this small, uh, uh, incomplete osteotomy of the base of the P1. And as you do that, the extensors which you've left intact will straighten the PIPJ. Let me demonstrate. So here we are correcting the MTPJ level and you can see those friendly extensors then straightening out the toe at the PIPJ level. If you have done the sort of routine extensor tenotomy already, then you'll end up correcting the toe at the MTPJ level with the osteotomy, but the toe will be floppy and flexed still at the PIPJ level, which is a shame. Okay, a little uh, bit of artwork to demonstrate this. I think this will one. So the osteotomy really does need to be at this metaphyseal diaphyseal junction because the flexor runs in a pulley here and it's at risk. The flexor tendon is at risk if you're not careful in avoiding that. So you don't want to really do a metaphyseal osteotomy. You want diaphyseal metaphyseal junction. So we've done our first sweep there and back in with the burr uh, to take a second sweep if we need to, if we need a bit more correction, sweeping left to right. And as I said to you, if you then put the burr through and go through the second cortex, you can gain even more correction. So you kind of dial it in. Uh, so that completes the hallux valgus correction, too. but you can see there's a hammer toe in this patient. Uh, and in a flexible, mild to moderate hammer toe, I would tend to correct this with a P1 plantar closing percutaneous osteotomy, which is what I'm going to show you now. So the skin incisions on the plantar aspect by gripping the MTPJ between index finger and thumb, then the incision is just beyond your thumb on the plantar aspect there. Having made the incision, the burr is inserted up to the flexor sheath and then through it and into the bone. Once all the flutes of the burr are within the bone, as you see here, it is not going to damage the flexor tendon. Then by sweeping the burr from one side to the other, you can cut through the cortex on the left and the right hand side, but leaving the dorsal hinge intact as you see in the picture here in the top right, and then you can close it very easily with your thumb and you can already see the toes sitting in a corrected position. There we are, so moving on. What about correcting deformity at the PIPJ level? So assuming a rigid deformity uh, in this scenario. Uh, well, we've got our tenotomies, our selective tenotomies. We've heard how to do a, a selective flexor, tenotomy flexor, uh, digitorum brevis. 
that's really something to be demonstrated in the lab um, rather than here in the presentation. So I'm going to concentrate more on the P2 osteotomy, which you can see here as well. So most of the time, because it's going to be a flexion deformity, a plant flexion deformity at the PIPJ level, you'll be kind of reversing the osteotomy we've done in the P1 and leaving a planter cortex intact. So we do a dorsal uh, closing wedge and elevate the tip of the toe. Uh, and again, you don't need this every time. If it's a flexible deformity, I've shown you that most of the time the extensor tendon will do the work for you. But if you have got a degree of rigidity, stiffness in that PIPJ, this is where this particular osteotomy becomes useful. Again, it's an eight millimeter, uh, but if, if you prefer, you can still do a PIPJ fusion. And again, you can do that uh, percutaneously, both the P2 osteotomy and the PIPJ fusion, I do through a mid-axis incision. And again, with the help of image intensifier, I don't use a condylectomy much, but you might want to do that perhaps in an elderly patient with a, with a corn or something over that area. It might be a nice simple thing to do to ease the pain for them. And you can do DIPJ fusions too. The other interesting thing is that if you slightly alter the apex of your uh, osteotomy, the hinge rather, that you've left intact, you can start dialing in a little bit of varus or valgus correction into your sagittal plane correction too. So that's why I said at the beginning, you really have got complete control in, a th in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So you can, with a little bit more experience, then start undertaking more powerful corrections and you can use oblique osteotomies. And these, if you think to your sort of, think back to your finger fracture management, uh, these will slide and rotate and they're very interesting. You've got to know how they behave, but you can use the forces from the soft tissues to your advantage to create perhaps a little bit of shortening as well as sagittal plane correction as well. And here's an example. So this is no word of a lie. I've not created this uh, for this evening. This was an 83 year old gentleman, no metatarsalgia. Look at the top left picture, but he had pain in his shoes, perhaps not surprisingly from those long toes. So top left, bottom left is where we started. And rather than doing a DMMO, which you might argue would be the purest view that his, metas his um, lesser rays need shortening centrally, um, I decided that wasn't warranted. And I did an oblique osteotomy of toes two and three. And the next picture along on the bottom row shows the, the, how it looked intraoperatively, perhaps three minutes in. Now, I'll stop there because I'm beginning to sort of introduce that idea that percutaneous surgery is really fast and you're going to save loads of time. In some areas it can be, and with some osteotomies and corrections it can be, but I would say on the whole, percutaneous surgery of the lesser toes isn't necessarily faster. It's more elegant and it's more versatile and it's more comprehensive. So that's what it looked like immediately. And that's what it looked like at one week. He could wait there immediately uh, and there's much less in the way of risk to the soft tissues. So I think that was a useful uh, tool in my armamentarium for that patient. Fixation postoperatively, where you saw in the last picture, I'd use strapping. You can use K-wires. Uh, you can also use external sutures, which is a bit of a new concept uh, compared to open surgery. Or you can use little elliptical excisions just of the skin on the dorsal aspect, which you then close, and that tethers the toe straight as well. I find that one very useful. So you decide on which option depending on patient compliance and their needs and what you're up to. Uh, and the post-op regime is pretty straightforward, but the nice thing is that the uh, degree of elevation and the restriction in terms of the bandages is usually one week. Uh, things tend to heal that much quicker if you've only made a keyhole tiny stab incision, as long as the patient is good about keeping the foot up. Um, Otherwise, nothing there particularly exciting. Here's another example. Again, not, not a novice case. So uh, a, a dislocation of the second MTPGA previous fracture of M3. And I decided to shorten second, uh, second and fourth metatarsals as well as correct toes through phalangeal osteotomies. Uh, and here we are at nine months post-op. And then I saw him for a different problem. I promise it wasn't the same problem and couldn't help but get a little video of the toe four years down the line. So with more experience, as I say, most toe deformities you'll be able to take on percutaneously if you wish. Another one, 73 year old nurse, severe deformity. And here I combined it with open surgery. So fusion of the first ray, first MTPJ, but a, an oblique osteotomy showing how powerful that can be to correct that second toe. 
So my algorithm, don't worry, it's rather busy, but if you look at the left-hand side with a flexible mild to moderate deformity, I'm gonna go for the osteotomy first rather than the soft tissues, I'm gonna leave the tendons intact. If it's a more severe deformity, it will also tend to be more stiff because that's how it works, in which case I'm gonna to want to free things up and that's where the soft tissue releases come in, perhaps the uh, selective extensive digitorum brevis release uh, that we heard from heard about from Mickey earlier to, to, to unstiffen, to, to create a bit more flexibility within the, P, the PIPJ um, and extensive tenotomies may be necessary. The P2 osteotomy may be necessary, but I think we're getting a bit too detailed there. So avoiding pitfalls, think about what the deformities are uh, carefully. You can examine those much more fully uh, because you've got an answer for them in three dimensionals, especially the varus and the valgus deformities. Uh, slow burst speeds. This is a gentle surgery. It's a delicate surgery. It's not agricultural. Um, make sure about the position of your osteotomies. Going back to the anatomy, it really does matter that you know where you're placing these osteotomies and what's at risk. Uh, and think about the best methods of post-op control. Uh, always warn the patient that even though it's percutaneous surgery, you've still broken the bone and it's still going to be a chipolata sausage uh, of a toe. They're very popular in England. I don't know if they are elsewhere. Um, but also, perhaps most importantly, learn in a safe, no consequence environment, which is a lab, a cadaveric lab. And uh, there are lots of training labs run now, which are very good. So there are definitely new options percutaneously, as well as the old. Uh, and percutaneously, percutaneous surgery in the literature is associated with less post-operative pain. And that's uh, in that literature review I've, I'm, I'm sending you via Elena. There's a lower infection rate in some papers, almost half that associated with open surgery. Uh, but there's still relatively or very limited comparative data. Um, I think the outcomes that I have seen are similar overall, however. So I'm not saying that uh, open surgery is inferior. I'm just saying that actually I think the risks are less, the pain is less with the percutaneous surgery, and I have more in my armamentarium. I hope I'm convincing you. So we've dealt with hamatos. Let's go on to DMMOs. DMMOs, well, let's start with the vial. We're all familiar with the vial and the limitations of the vial. It's not a perfect operation. I performed it for more than 10 years. And what used to frustrate me was that the cases I thought I'd done the best operation on might be the one that got the floating tail or the, or the stiffness. Maybe others have found techniques to avoid that. I've looked at the literature carefully. I can see no evidence that that's the case, that anybody has a particular solution. The nice thing about the DMMO is that it's a distal metaphyseal metatarsal osteotomy and the word extracapsular is really important. It is an extracapsular, extra-articular osteotomy. So you're not making the osteotomy within the joint. There are some variations on a theme later on when you're more experienced that you might do intra-articularly, but the traditional DMMO uh, is not intra-articular. It is a combination really probably of a BRT and a vial in terms of its mechanism because there's a little bit of elevation and some shortening. And you control that with careful positioning of the osteotomy. Here you see uh, a sore bone example. Uh, it's a 12 millimeter burr, gentle surgery, rotating the hand, and you'll like the toe disappearing in a second. There it goes. That really doesn't happen in real life. Um, and it is really important. I'm going to stress the importance that you must get the osteotomy in the right position. We're all probably familiar with the halal osteotomy. And if you make the osteotomy too proximal, you're going to get a big rotatory moment and you'll get much more elevation of the metatarsal head than you were intending. Uh, the osteotomy really does need to be in the right place. Here on the right hand side, you can see the osteotomy is too distal. It's intra-articular. So you only get a little bit of elevation you get quite a bit of shortening. And this is one of my x-rays. I had done this uh, complication some years ago, I would add, uh, and it led to a stiff toe. I had to go back in and burr away that prominence. So you want it just in the right place. And there's the example there at the diaphyseal metaphyseal junction. And there are very nice uh, techniques, methods to help you achieve that. Uh, and when you're experienced, you won't really need to use the x-ray other than to check the final result. There are also some nice variations so you can get pure elevation if you make a complete or a, an incomplete osteotomy. But again, that's probably not where we'd start. 
you also need to be careful about your hand positioning. So I'm just trying to demonstrate this is not a, uh, an operation to suddenly think, well, I know enough, I think I'll go and have a go. You need to try this in the lab. You need to be competent in the lab before you try it on a patient, because if you leave your hands too high, it will have an effect on the plane of the osteotomy, and that effect will be different in each foot, encouraging either the head to move laterally or to discourage lateral movement. And you can use that to your advantage again, but it's about understanding this. Okay, so summary of differences, vial is open, percutaneous option, DMMO is extra articulate. You don't need to fix the DMMO. And in fact, in that literature set I've given you, I can show you uh, the, a paper showing that you don't need to fix your vials. It's not necessary. I can also show you that the vial uh, doesn't, it doesn't change the plantar forces if you take the little slither of bone out as I used to either. So a lot of the things that we actually get used to doing out of habit uh, aren't necessarily supported by the literature. Okay, let's move on. So you, with the DMMO, you absolutely can shorten, but it's not all about the length of the metatarsal. And I would argue, again, within your literature pack, that the, we should do away with the maestro harmonic curve. No disrespect to the uh, authors involved. They're all great surgeons. Um, but the maestro's harmonic curve bears no relation to the outcomes in open met lesser metatarsal surgery. It does not correlate with the outcomes in lesser metatarsal surgery, either open or in percutaneous surgery. And there are articles to confirm that within your literature pack. Um, why is that? Well, because you've got to think about the third plane, the sagittal plane. So if you look at this x-ray as one of mine, you'd say, well, that third metatarsal is short. Look at the oblique view. It's clearly not short. It's plantar flex. So we've got to be clear. Are we talking about real or apparent length? And that's where you can be tripped up. Um, but I think the DMMOs can be a really useful adjunct. I use them sparingly, as I would do the vial. Um, and the more you use well, something, yeah. you more, the more you realize that and it's not the panacea well. that you were hoping for. There are very few yeah, things well. in surgery that I think conform to That's the fab. definition of a panacea. So here, this was a case with hallux valgus and hallux rigidus, and I shortened them in the first ray, but in so doing, felt I really need to shorten, needed to shorten her centrally. Uh, and the DMMOs uh, being quite powerful, one tends to do the second, third, and fourth, and because it's extra articular, you're not worried about the stiffness. Um, a lot is made or has been made about the swelling after DMMOs, uh, but I have found that using a short air cast boot to treat them like the fractures that they are makes a dramatic difference. And it means that the patient's far more comfortable. So at week two, when they've tread leveled in their flat shoe and they come back for their review, I put them into one of these boots and let them go for it. And that makes a massive difference by eight weeks. I feel there's no difference compared to the swelling I would expect to see perhaps after a, a fixed vial. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Literature, what is the evidence? There's still no perfect solution. And if you go to the bottom line, I still hold by my view that try to use lesser metatarsal osteotomies, whether open or percutaneous, sparingly. Um, both open and percutaneous seem to offer similar results in the literature. DMMO, less operating time, less pain, and fewer soft tissue complications supported by the literature. Less stiffness in my experience, but as yet not proven in the literature. And comparative data still really does remain very sparse. So we're nearly at the end of my talk. We've just got the bunny nets to talk about. And this is a little bit of self-promotion, I suppose. I'm allowed it at the end of my talk. So the red fern bunny net classification, which I've published, uh, and it makes things very simple. Either the fifth toe is straight in association with the bump or the fifth toe is inverous. If the fifth toe is straight, then you can treat it with a shaving of the fifth metatarsal head. If the fifth toe is inverous, you need to do an osteotomy. And that osteotomy is a DMMO, which we've already discussed. So you already have in your armamentarium the complete uh, pack for treating bunionettes, either a DMMO or a small shaving akin to a bunion, uh, shaving a bunion reduction on the medial side. So here are some x-rays just demonstrating that. When you do a DMMO of the fifth metatarsal, the soft tissues, the extensors and flexors, because they are medial to that fifth ray, they will pull the head medially. So again, you don't need to fix it. The head will always, always move medially. Uh, and the most that you might want to do is some taping. Uh, so here's another example, not quite a severe case, but you can see having done the osteotomy, the heads move medially. The arrow on the right is the single portal that I used for that. So really nice in terms of soft tissue healing and avoiding painful scars. 
and that was the taping that the patient had during the post-operative period. You can add a boot into the mix if you want in terms of getting it to heal um, a bit more comfortably, especially otherwise the swelling can persist, as you'd expect if you left somebody with a metatarsal fracture without support. Um, the return to function is even quicker if you've just done a shaving and for those patients, whether it's a shaving of the fifth metatarsal head or the bunion on the medial side, they're usually back into a shoe at one week and return to normal activity very quickly. So evidence of bunionettes, well, both open and percutaneous seem to offer similar results. Uh, I think the percutaneous is simple and elegant, less operating time, no fixation, very few complications, but no comparative data as yet. So I think we've dealt with everything. Overall, my final comments, percutaneous lesser toe surgery, versatile, elegant, less pain than open, proven. Fewer soft tissue complications, including infection, proven. Uh, new tools in the armamentarium, there's your biggest reason for having a look at it. And in my opinion, more comprehensive correction of the lesser toe deformities. Thank you very much. And I will now unshare. David, that was outstanding.